James Going, glad you're working with Sean again. He's a collaborative person. Just very misunderstood. He is, mate. Yes, people, hope you're well. So I'll just let the numbers come in. There was 200 people that wanted me to come back on, so I'll just let the numbers come in. Anyone that's coming in, please like, subscribe, and share the content that's about to be spoken now. It's true crime. It's about an incident in my life. That's factual. It's all there in the public domain. Anyone can go into the Echo, the Liverpool Echo, and read what I'm about to ask, speaking about. I'll give it a couple of minutes to let everyone come back in. Obviously, me moderators, you're going to have a lot of work to do tonight. Why? Because it's open to anyone. You haven't got to be a subscriber to come and watch this feed on YouTube now. It's open to the public and anyone can come and listen to what I'm about to speak about. It's factual. There's no coming out of my mouth on this. It's all genuine. If it's, if it, it's about an incident that's happened to me in 2018 when people tried to shoot me dead. So share, like, and subscribe. Obviously, TikTok. If you want to get, if you want to be focused on, you're best going onto the YouTube channel. But I'm going to leave my TikTok channel open so you can hear this story. It's a genuine story. It's real crime. It's to do with the Kinian cartel and other individuals from the city of Liverpool that participated in the conspiracy to shoot me dead. In the process, they shot another individual and not me. That's why I survived. Lady G, you're going to have your work cut out. I haven't seen any of the moderators kick back in just yet, but obviously you're going to need them. Hi, the sky, hope you're well. Anyone that's just locking in the YouTube, I haven't really acknowledged you, but I know you're all there, and it's good to have you in. JD, hope you're well. It is what it is. I'll uh, give it a couple of more minutes, let the numbers get up again, and then I'll, I'll start about. I'll start talking about what it is and what I'm about to speak about. I'll just get on with it. I'm going to open up with a Liverpool Echo publication that happened at the time. The headline of that publication is "I'm Breathing, Believing." Darren G. Rapp appears to claim Grisdale shooting was meant for him. Track released under Jay's name, published on the same day as Everton Attack. Lulu, thanks for that. So what you're going to hear now is a report from the Liverpool Echo that was published on that time at that date. I hope they don't mind me using this content. It is what it is. It starts like this. Notorious criminal Darren G appears to have released a rap video claiming a brutal Everton street shooting was meant for him. Lyrics including I'm breathing, believing, still going, achieving form the basis for a near five minute video posted on the day a man was blasted in the back of a private hire taxi. The shooting came on the Grisdale estate, the street in one on the shooting came on Mary Paul Close, the street in the once troubled Grisdale estate that G lived on before being jailed over the gangland murder in 2006. G was handed an 18-year jail term for planning the revenge murder of father of five at the time of a heightened trouble of heightened trouble between feuding North Liverpool gangs. Since being released, he appears to have turned his attention to music, producing a series of videos watched by several thousand over recent months. On Sunday, a flurry of new recordings appeared to reference the shooting that night. Just after 8pm, a man was left fighting for his life after being shot in the upper legs when a gunman thought to have been with an associate opened the back door of a private hire cab and pulled the trigger on a handgun. A female was just sat inches from the 39-year-old victim whose condition has since improved. Following the shocking attack, G took to the internet to rap Bill and Ben the flower pot men. They've been around watering the flowers again watering the flowers again, trying to bring pain. 
L5 alive, I'm here to survive, I'm breathing, believing, still going, achieving. In the same 4 minute 49 second video titled Don't Cry You Know, he makes reference to an innocent man being shot. The video was one of several uploaded under the name Darren G on Sunday. Two included what appeared to be CCTV footage of forensics officers working on Mary Poor Close in the aftermath of the shooting, which has prompted police to increase patrols in the area. In one of those pieces, G narrated over footage of forensics placing a tent over the shooting scene and said, now this tent, people, brings back memories. These tents normally only mean one thing. Two weeks away from April 6th, people that know, know, especially rats that had a go tonight. Someone's watching me, got to be. Detectives probing the shooting believe it was a targeted attack, though yesterday they were unclear of the motive and whether the victim was the intended target. They have appealed for information about two men seen in the area around the time of the shooting and who are thought to have fled through a path onto Whitehaven Road, either on foot or push bikes. Back in 2006, G, then 27, was convicted of conspiracy to murder David Regan at his old Swan car wash business. The 2004 summer shooting was the explosive climax of a North Liverpool drugs war which rocked the area. Mr Regan Terry Socks was shot three times in the back and legs with investigators believing he was blasted as revenge for the earlier shooting of 19-year-old Craig Barker the previous month. Mr Barker was killed on April 6, which may explain what G is referring to when he mentions the date. G was sitting in a Ford Galaxy on Robson Street, Evan, which was sprayed with bullets when his close friend Mr Barker was killed. He always believed he was the gunman's intended target. That was the Liverpool Echo write-up people at the time. And what they're, just, what they're talking about there, people, is an incident that happened on the 17th of March, 2018. It was a Sunday. I'm going to give you a bit, anyone that's donated there, thank you. I'm going to give you a bit of a, a, bit of a background story to the situation. I'm released from custody in June the 21st, 2016. I'm placed on stringent license conditions, map of 3T of 4, 2% of the criminal fraternity or released violent prisoners go into that category. I was one of them. I weren't allowed into the city of Liverpool for a long, long time, 18 months whilst my license was in position. As soon as my licence conditions was up, I moved back into Liverpool, into my mum's house on the Grisdale Estate, which is 25 Mary Port Close. Around that time, I've got a couple of nephews called Stephen and Billy. Billy was the, was the son of my eldest brother who's committed suicide and hung himself. Stephen was the son of my third, third youngest brother. They were 14 and 13 at the time. When I rang them back in the area, I've had a certain few groups trying to pull me back into crime and I refused to do so. They wasn't happy and they took it as an offence. They, they then started spinning a narrative that I was going to take the graft and people weren't happy. In the area at that time, there was a lad called Liam Cornett, known as The Lamb. The Lamb worked for the Kinian Cartel in the city of Liverpool. The Lamb had known to put people in bed, one individual in Birmingham, outside a gymnasium. He blasted them with an AK and put them to sleep. This individual, Liam Cornett, was running around Danfield like he owned the place, running around Liverpool like he owned the place. Why? Because he had the backup of the Irish cartel. He was bullying my youngest nephew, Billy G, the son of my brother who had killed himself. And I was not happy. And I let it known that I wasn't happy. One incident to recognise what happened in this build up to this shooting and attempt upon my life was when Liam the Lamb Cornet and the Eves brothers grabbed hold of my nephew of 14, held him to the ground and cut his face with a blade, telling him to tell his uncle Darren that I'm nothing and they're the new men in town. They've got connections in Europe 
and he doesn't want us. I'm not happy about that incident and I'm looking for this little rat. He's avoiding me like the plague. I can't grab hold of him even though I'm chasing him. On one occasion, it is what it is. Eventually, it goes on. I'm doing a rap about these kids. I do a rap, I do it on my live feed. I tell them straight how it is. I tell them where they're living on the power on Flower Road, ek, ek, ek. Straight after that rap, straight after I've spat that freestyle up on my live feed on Instagram, my young brother Ian was targeted by the individuals. He was driving around on Robson Street when a car pulled up next to him and let off a firearm, a 45 pistol. The bullet went right through the car and so on and so forth. I won't go into depth on that story, but that was the start of a plot to kill me. I sat down with an individual called Kevin Wheatman and his uncle called Thomas Christian. The reason I sat down with these individuals was because my younger brother begged me not to do what I was about to do. I'm fresh out of jail. I've just finished my license conditions off an 18-year prison sentence. And Ian, the youngest brother, was shook knowing what was going to come next. He's begged me to give this Kevin Wheatman, the snitch, a chance. I've said, OK. I've got them into my ma's kitchen, let them know the score, shook hands, and they've left. Within six weeks of that, someone came back and tried to shoot me dead. During all this process, Daniel Kinahan appeared into my life. He jumped out the back of a vehicle and told me I need to pack this in to jump on board. That was that. Come to the 17th of March, 2018. In the week running up to this shooting, it was very intense. There was a lot of people that became involved in this conspiracy. I was aware of a man called Tony Judge, who used to work and still works for a man called the banker called Philly Glennon. Tony Judge supplied the firearm, which was given to Kevin Wheatman and a young man called O'Shea. The firearm came from Daniel Kinahan. On the 17th of March, I'm with an individual that I classed as my brother's best mate, Billy's best mate. His name is Anthony Ferris. I'm with, it. I'm with Anthony Ferris all day. We come to the point where I've got to go to my mother's for whatever reason. I'm with Anthony Ferris. I go into my mum's house and doing what I'm doing. Anthony Ferris calls a taxi and comes into the house and says, the taxi's here, we need to hurry up and get in this taxi. He goes out with his missus, sits in the back of the taxi. As I'm coming out the door, two gunmen have pounced with two firearms, thinking Anthony Ferris was me. They start shooting Anthony Ferris and stop dead in the process and then get, get away on the mountain bikes. I give chase, but they've gone. Now that's the bottom line of the shooting. Now let's get into why it happened. As you've just heard me say there, the lamb, Ian Cornett, he was a soldier for the Irish cartel, mainly Daniel Kinahan. He was doing madness around the city and distributing large amounts of drugs for them. I was terrorising this individual. Daniel Kinahan told me to back off him. He got told where to go. He took that as a major insult and went out his way to recruit these individuals to participate in the murder. Kevin Whitman and O'Shea. O'Shea was recruited because he just got out of prison off a short prison sentence. He's only a young lad. He wanted money. He didn't know what he was getting himself involved with. And he ended up being a gunman for these individuals. Daniel Kinahan and the Lamb used these two kids to kill me. It never happened. They put a lad in hospital and that's that. On the 18th, so on the 18th of March, 2008, 17th of March, 2018, I'm just doing my daily thing. As I've just said, I come out the house, I'm about to get in a taxi, the gunmen pounce thinking it's me and end up shooting the kid that set me up, Anthony Ferris. Instead of killing this individual, they let him survive when he realised it was not me in the back of the taxi. The thing that followed on from that was madness. It just went off its cake. 
I go out as soon as that shooting's happened, I go back in to my house, do a live feed and tell people, don't worry, I'll fire the live. I'm breathing, believing and achieving. That was that was the live feed that I just spoke to you about in the Echo Report. You're probably thinking, how do I know it was Daniel Kinahan that sorted this conspiracy to murder out? Why did it happen? It happened basically because their favourite soldier on the streets of Liverpool was getting terrorised by me. He was just a little rat with money and guns and he was a fart. He was getting terrorised. The shooting happens, it goes messy for me and that's it basically. It goes on. Anthony Ferris received six gunshot wounds to his lower half of his body and was put in hospital. It became very relevant to me that Anthony, Anthony Ferris had set me up that day. He'd got me to my Mars, he'd phoned the taxi. The names of the Eves brothers and the Lamb and the, the way they held me young nephew down, Billy and Cutters, cut his chin with a knife. This was the lead up to it. Now, when you hear me speaking about Daniel Kinahan and why they tried to attack me in 2017 and get me shot dead, I'm not lying. I'm telling the truth. People can't deny what happened. It's the truth. As we go on, as we move along, it's getting messy for me. You know, within six weeks, so the first attempt on the 17th of March, they failed. Within eight weeks of that attack, there was another attack on the same estate attacking me with a firearm again. They never, they never, they never done the job again. I'm there doing what I do best, spitting me lyrics, promoting me message of choose a life, not a knife. And now I've become L5 alive, down to the shooting. The shooting was messy. As I say, it was a young kid called O'Shea. I've been aware of who it was from the next day. I know exactly who was involved. I know exactly who participated. Straight after the shooting, I've gone into my mother's house. My mother's house is full of cameras. I've took the hard drive out. The hard drive went missing. I was arrested for perverting the course of justice, then released without charge. Daniel Kinahan and his people in Liverpool, which is very wide, let's call them the Liverpool Mafia of your life. They wanted me dead and I weren't going nowhere. For the following year, I was getting attacked, I was getting me flat burnt out and I was getting told to be quiet and shut your mouth. They started calling me a snitch, they started writing me off, although I never made statements in that attack, even though I knew who it was. I'd like to go deeper. I'd like to go in and give you all the true facts. I'm going to speak about a kid called Tony Judge. Tony Judge is a very quiet individual that makes a lot of money through drug crime. He relocated to Dubai in 2019 because he understood the danger that would come from me. He understood I knew he passed the gun on through Paul Riley into the hands of Kevin Wheatman, into the hands of O'Shea. You might have heard me speak about Kevin Wheatman in the past where his dad, Tony Christian, was given evidence in our murder trial and it came out in court that his dad was a paid informer and was given intelligence to the police for six months. I weren't doing nothing wrong. I was just doing my thing, going through my life. And a lot of individuals got shook because of my past crimes and my past notoriety within the city. They asked me to jump on board with two different factions. And then factions, I'd, I'd done a couple of fatalities in the city at the time. I don't really know where to start because there's loads of dynamics. There's loads of situations kicking in at once here. People want to know how... And where does Daniel Kinahan come into this matter? As I spoke before about Lamb, Liam Cornett, he was a soldier for Daniel Kinahan and the Kinahan cartel on the streets of Liverpool. He was distributing narcotics and firearms to everyone and anyone. 
He was threatened by my presence now around the area. He suspected me of wanting to take over the drug trade once again. He was far wrong. He was well off the mark. But he had this narrative in his mind and he started picking on my nephews. My nephews, who was only three when I went to prison, have got out of custody. They're now 13 and 14 years old. One second, people. I thought he heard something outside the door, so I've got me trusted hammer on side. So anyway, as I said, the Lamley and Cornet, his little rice and all these individuals were shut. The way to get to me, instead of coming seeing me and dealing with me, they went round the corner and coughed me little nephew, young Billy. They've held him down, they've cut him. I haven't been happy about this. I've been on a mission. I've been looking for this little doing damage. Daniel Kinnahan's heard about this situation, popped up, jumped out of the back of a van, spoke to me for a few minutes, and then got on his way. From that point on, my life was in danger for obvious reasons. You've got the lamb who's been in the city whilst I've been in custody, doing what he wants, doing what he wants, where he wants, and I've got out and stood up to him told him how it is and had him shook. The Lammers went to his boss, Daniel Kinnahan, and the Irish cartel and started putting a narrative across and whatever. So it was in motion. No one was willing to come and try and take me out. No one was willing to come and do this shooting other than a young, naive lad who'd just been released from a YOY offenders called O'Shea. He's got out, he's desperate for money. These rats have recruited him through Kevin Wheatman. O'Shea's being recruited by Kevin Wheatman and the lamb. Kevin Wheatman was one of the lamb's boys. Kevin Wheatman mixed with the lamb and run round for the lamb. They needed a gunman who was game and they got young O'Shea. On the day of the shooting, I'm with Anthony Ferris and his girlfriend, Lisa Wewell. I'd been into, a, I'd, I'd just got a flat. I'd got off licence. It was getting a bit sticky in my mother's house. So I needed accommodation. I got accommodation on the count, on County Road in Walton. I'd been down there all day with Anthony Ferris painting and decorating this flat. Bang on six o'clock, Anthony Ferris all of a sudden needs to get back to his house fast. If you just come up, Darren and help us get through the door, blah, 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 and then we'll come back down and finish the last wall. We'll paint the last wall. So I'm none of the wiser. I'm thinking Anthony Ferris is a good friend of Billy and so on and so forth. He convinces me to leave the last wall, go up to his, open his door for him. In that process, when I'm in his house, I'm, I'm sat there in the kitchen, and I hear someone outside, Anthony Ferris, shout Ferris. Ferris goes through the, to the front door, has a little bit of a conversation with this individual, then comes back in. Five minutes later, he says, let's go back down to yours now, Dad, and I've rang a taxi to your mother's house. So that was the first little OK. So I go down to my mum's house. I'm in the house. I'm doing what I do. I'm getting a few bits to take down to my new flat. Ferris is becoming very impatient. He's becoming very anxious about the situation. I recognise this, but I'm just thinking he's in a rush for whatever reason. He rings the taxi. The taxi appears. He goes out to the taxi. I'm still in the house. I go out to the taxi with him, but then turn around and go back in because I've forgot me Rizzler and I've got me weed. So I've gone back in, got me Rizzler, got me weed. As I'm on my way out the, out the ta as, I'm, as I'm looking for the Rizzler and the weed, Andy Ferris comes back in and goes, the taxi's being impatient, Dad, and he's telling us to hurry up. So he goes back out, gets in the taxi. As I'm coming out and knocking my mother's front door, two men get on the taxi, open the back door of the taxi, and start firing two firearms into Andy Ferris, believing it was me. After that incident, as soon as that's happened, they've got off. I've jumped over the fence and chased them. They pedaled away and got off. 
The taxi with Anthony and his girlfriend in has burnt off towards the hospital. A friend of mine who was watching out the window come out his house. Well, he wasn't a friend. He, he knew what was happening. Facing me house, we've got a kid called Jared Gilboy. He's in his bedroom window watching the whole incident. As soon as the incident happened and he realised I've survived, he's come out his house, sneaked across the front and got off. He never come over to see if it was all right. So straight away, I'm taking all this on board. When you've got hindsight, it's a beautiful thing. When you've got hindsight, you can go back over situations and recount situations for what they really was. I go straight back into my life. I go by, back into my mother's house, as I said before. My ma's house is full of cameras. I go in there, I'm doing a live feed, and I tell people, don't worry, people, L5's are alive. I'm still believing, achieving, and breathing, blah, blah, blah. The aftermath of that, six weeks later, they come back and try and shoot me again. Now, since that, the hindsight was beautiful. I could put the picture together. I could understand who was what and what was what. And the bottom line is this. Daniel Kinnahan, through Tony Judge, passed the firearms to Kevin Wheatman and O'Shea, which was the Lambs good little mates. They turned up to do the shooting. They the shooting up. And then there was panic stations. They didn't know what was going to come and why it was going to come. My little brother, Ian, who I don't speak to no more and I've completely disowned for this reason. He met the individuals that tried to kill me four weeks later and tried to set another meeting up with these individuals. I've declined. It is what it is. I can start bringing it right back to the beginning. I can start giving all the intricate details of it. But the ballpark of the situation was this. The Kinnahan cartel soldier on the streets of Liverpool, Liam Cornett, was shook. I was approached by Daniel Kinnahan after the night had put the wrap out and they shot the car through it in. I was out looking blue murder. Daniel Kinnahan's come down and said, bam, 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 bam. He then went out his way to get me put to bed. He couldn't have me stepping on his toes in that area. When the Kinnerton cartel stepped foot in Liverpool, they started eradicating the main players in the city. The ones that weren't playing ball were being shot dead. The ones that did play ball got turned into what you call now the Liverpool Mafia, and it still exists until this day. I'm going to get a lot of people saying, what's this, what's that? He's, chat he's chatting now. I'm not. It's true facts. Since that day on, I have hated the bones of Daniel Kinnahan. I have wrote Daniel Kinnahan off left, right and centre. I can't stand the prick. Why? Because he tried to get me killed. His soldiers, Lamb and the Eves brothers, started targeting my little nephews who were, eight, who were 13 and 14. Young Billy, who got his face cut by these individuals, was getting bullied by these individuals at the age of 13. And he was participating in doing certain things for the lamb at that time. The lamb managed to put young Billy in debt. And Billy had no choice but to do what he was told by the lamb. When I've got off my licence conditions and I've stepped back foot into Liverpool and I'm hearing about this, I'm not happy and I'm putting a stop to it. I'm not letting my young nephew, whose dad has just died through hanging himself a year or two before, be groomed and terrored by this little head. That's the bottom line of why that attack happened. Liam Cornett was shook. He didn't know what to do. He called on his power base to deal with the situation and no one wanted to come to me and kill me. A young lad called O'Shea had just been released from prison and he was desperate for money and he was a little game kid. He had this group of individuals groom him, manipulated him and encouraged him that he paid a large amount of money to put me to bed. He attempted to put me, bed, put me to bed and he never succeeded. He put the rat who set me up and got me to my mum's at that time, six o'clock, quarter past six. He got them instead. Now, when these individuals come to shoot you dead, they shoot you dead. So when they've opened that taxi door, 
there's two gunmen, O'Shea one, I don't know the other one. There was two of them, I'm suggesting it was the lamb. These two individuals have came with two firearms. That's a calling card of the Kinian cartel. The majority of the people that the Kinian cartel have put to bed, two firearms are being used on that individual. That's their calling card. The incident, so take it from my point of view. I'm on my mother's step. I'm about to lock the front door. The gunman have came. The attack anti Ferris. All I can hear coming from that taxi is Anthony Ferris screaming, it's Anthony, it's Ferris, it's Ferris. On the back of that shout, the shooting stops dead, the gunman get on the toes. That was a prime example of a... F if they would have carried on doing the shooting, he was dead. If he wouldn't have told them that it was Anthony Ferris, they would have carried on shooting him dead. If that was me in the back of the taxi, I would have been filt from legs to chest, bottom line. There was a reason why they stopped on him. Now, you're trying to... Let me try and link for you as factual information. At one point, during that process, you had a world-famous MMA fighter called Conor McGregor floating around the city, going to parties in the Heighton area, partying with this lamb. You'd had other individuals who was in that group who participate in the Kinian cartel at the time. There was photos of them going around the city. I've still got photos of them now with the lamb and McGregor in the same photo shot. That was the link there. That's who came to kill me in the 2018. Ignore the gunmen who pull the triggers. Concentrate on the individual that put it into practice. And it was Daniel Kinnahan. So when you hear me speaking about Daniel Kinnahan, when you hear me writing him off as a horrible little, that baldy little fat prick had the opportunity to do what he wanted to do to me face to face at the bottom of Bailey Road South. I'm with Ian looking for these individuals, especially in Lamb. As I said earlier on, a jeep pulls up and out the back of that jeep jumps this little Irish called Daniel Kinnahan. The conversation went like this. Why don't you just pack it all in and jump on board with us? He was told straight, I'm not into that way of life. I'm not participating in anything to do with you. And that's what brought it on. So he gave me the option of jumping on board. And when I refused to jump on board, he's give the kids the access to the firearms that came to kill me. A lot of people aren't going to believe me and I don't expect you to. But it's the truth. It's the truth. No one can deny it. It's factual. It's all there. If you want to go onto the Liverpool Echo and pump in attempted murder on Mary Paul Close at Darren G, 2018, the 17th of March, it's all there to read. I'm still here standing. That At that point, it was touch and go whether I'd return to my old ways. It was touch and go of me picking a firearm up and going out and doing what I can do if I've got to do it. I decided not to. I could have jumped on board with the powerless organisation in Liverpool at that time, which was the Kinian cartel. As I stated before, there's a lot of rumours going round on why the likes of Big Fish, likes of Colin Smith was shot dead and other individuals around the city were shot dead. They were shot dead by the Irish cartel. It doesn't matter who they recruited to pull the trigger. The order came from the Kinian cartel. Colin Smith was shot dead because he could move tons of Class A drugs around the city and around the country. He wasn't playing ball. He was removed so the Kinian cartel could take a stronghold in Liverpool. Not many people are going to accept that, what I've just said to you, is, but that's the truth and that's the fact. Everyone's saying it was the boxer that was responsible for doing the murder of Colin Smith outside the gymnasium and speak all them years ago. It may have been, but he was under orders from the Kinian cartel. These individuals 
after them shootings off to Dubai, a safe haven, and that's where they've been since. That's the story about the 17th of March, 2018. Obviously, I've skimmed through it. I've shot through it dead fast. The real detail, the run-up, the people involved, the, the dynamics of the situ situation will be in my forthcoming book, which is currently being considered at the moment. Everything you want to hear about the whole situation will go into that. You know my uncle, John. Faye Smith, I do. I know John Smith well. John Smith's a good man. John Smith I met in Laden Grange in 2007 when I was shipped there from another prison. I landed on the induction wing and John Smith was a cleaner in that wing. I spent quite a bit of time with John Smith because there was allegations of me being an informer and there was allegations of me and William Moore and so on and so forth. Them allegations are still there. Them rumours are still there. John Smith knew the dynamics of that situation between me and the Moors. He was well in the know. He was a, he was a notorious individual. When I'm with John Smith at that time, his brother is shot dead at that time, Colin. I'm in custody with John Smith. I've got T-shirts and clothes that John Smith couldn't get handed in what he needed to attend the funeral. I had brand new clothes in my cell, which was given to John Smith so we could look presentable at his brother's funeral. On one of the occasions, John Smith, in conversation about his brother, when he was very emotional, he produced a book that his brother had sent into him, which was called GCHQ. It was about a government headquarters in, in Hertfordshire. And it, it, it gave you an insight into how they collected intelligence. He very kindly gave me that book. And I had that book for years until security took it out of my cell later on in HMP Woodhill. I've got nothing but respect for the Smith family. I've got nothing but respect for John Smith. They are what they are. They was what they are. They was. The death of Colin Smith Sr. had a very, very huge impact on Colin's son, who went on to participate in taking drugs and driving cars and ended up crashing his car and killing someone by accident. The message of choose a life, not a knife comes from me. It comes from my experience. It comes from my knowledge in the crime world. And I keep on reiterating to the youth and all the youth around the city and around the country not to participate in them snake pits of poison. You get used, you get abused, and if you don't play ball, you get put to bed. In other words, you get killed. Darren, will you do an audible version of your book, Le Bon, or will, when it's time to do it, hopefully Mr Atwood is the one to do that for me and help me get this book out there sooner rather than later. Choose a life, not a knife, has prevented me from picking up firearms and retaliating. Choose a life, not a knife, has prevented me from committing suicide. Choose a life, not a knife, has helped me remain free, although I've had incident after incident coming at me that would have, in the past, made me retaliate and seek revenge. That's why I believe in choose a life, not a knife, and that's why I promote it. It can change your narrative, it can change your way of thinking, and it can keep you free from all the traumatic experiences that you can experience if you go down the wrong path in your life. No one appreciates what I've been through in the last five years since my release from custody. I've been through a lot. I've had three attempts on my life. I've, I've had my apartment burned down. I've had my nieces and nephews targeted. I've had to sacrifice everyone in my life to get away from that. It's hard to do, but it can be done. Sometimes I've sat there and condemned people who've taken the same bridges as me and I don't condemn them people any longer. If you're taking the same bridges as me to get away from that, I applaud you, I don't condemn you no longer. 
I'm just a man trying to do better since his release from custody. In 2004, 2002, 2003, 2004, due to my upbringing, due to the elders I was around, I started participating in drug dealers from an early, early age, started participating in violent crime from an early age, and started using the revolving door of prison from an early age. In 2002, I was released from a 15-month prison sentence for, thre for threatening a prison officer in Walton. I started making a movement, got a little group of lads around me and formed a gang. We was on the Grisdale estate and the, we turned the Grisdale estate into a 24-hour drug den. We didn't use phones to sell drugs. We'd done it on the streets. We'd done it standing on a street corner like the majority of lads today. We started participating in violence for our own cause and for the causes of others. The violence erupted in a nasty way in the city, Liverpool, and it's, last, it's, it's left a long-lasting legacy of volatility and poisonous bullshit. People died, houses were burned, there was car bombs, there was nail bombs, there was people paralysed, there was people with their faces cut, knees broke, arms broke. That was 2004. Come to the climax of that, that situation, which was 2008, 2004 on the 18th of May. On the 6th of April, a young man called Craig Barker, a very close friend of mine at the time, was shot dead. You've heard me speak about it. I was the intended target at that time. On the run-up to that murder, I'd had two Osman warnings issued to me by Merseyside police. When they've knocked at my front door, these coppers in suits with this Osman warning. If you don't know what an Osman warning, let me just tell you what an Osman warning was at the time. There was an individual that was under observation. And while these individuals were under observation in London, they were speaking about killing an individual called Mr. Osman. The police knew this murder was going to happen, but never informed Mr. Osman. When Mr. Osman was shot dead, it then became a law that if police knew of intelligence of anyone's life being placed in danger, they had to warn that individual, offer them protection and a way out. My first Osman warn was issued to me in Delamore Street. The police knocked on the door, come into the house and said blatantly, Darren, there's a threat upon your life. We can't tell you where the threat's coming from and we don't really give it out to you. The only reason we are here is because you've got children in the house, you've got your mum in the house and you've got your nan in the house. Do you want protection? No. Sign here. Signed. A couple of years later, whilst back in Maryport, close on the Grisdale estate, I get another Osman warning. Same process. Please come. Darren, we don't give out to you. We're concerned about the people around you. Do you want protection? Yes or no? No. A couple of months after that, people have come to kill me. Craig Barker, that incident on the 6th of April is you've got me, Mark Richardson, who's doing life for the murder of Michael Wright, my youngest brother, Ian G, and Craig Barker. We sat in a galaxy. We'd been in a bit of a war with the Wright family and the Moore family. It went wrong. They'd come to kill me. An SAS gunman's come from nowhere, Darren Waterhouse, and shot Craig Barker dead, shooting him eight times, point blank in the chest. All them bullets that went into his chest went out his back and into my little brother's lower legs and lower body. Ian was in a coma for months. Craig Barker sadly passed away. Within a few weeks of that, the 18th of May, a plot was hatched. We went to Kensington and ended up shooting dead a man called David Regan. Within two days of that incident, I go into custody. By the 20th of May, I'm in custody. I'm on remand for two and a half years. I'm finally convicted in 2007. I'm given 18 years determinist sentence. I go through me jail, avoiding this, avoiding that, avoiding that. That's when I met John Smith. 
I go through my jail. I eventually get my parole date for 213. I'm refused my parole date on 213 due to police intelligence. And then entitled to another parole date in 214. Same again. I'm refused the parole date in 214. Eventually, the last parole date, it wasn't worth even going for. So I just stayed in jail till the 21st of June 2016. When I was on remand for that incident, my dirty dying dad passed away, but they wouldn't let me go to his funeral. When I come to the end of that sentence, the last year of my sentence, my eldest brother, who I loved so dearly, hung himself from the top of my mother's stairs. The police used the same reasons as why I couldn't go to my dad's funeral 10 years before. They used the same reasons as why I couldn't go to my brother's funeral 12 years later. Absolutely disgusting rats they are, the police. I get out. I'm placed on map of three tier four, as you all know. I'm not allowed in the city of Liverpool. The minute I'm allowed in the city of Liverpool, I go to Liverpool. 16th of June, 2021. Oh no, 16th of June, 2017. That's when my licence conditions ended. I moved back into my mother's house and by the 17th of March, people are trying to kill me dead. Right through that process, right through all them obstacles upon me release, right through being by my brother, right through being by other individuals, war on, whatever. I have never returned to violent crime. I have never went to pick a gun up or pick a knife up or damage anyone in any way. I've not committed a single offence of crime. I've been arrested two times for harassment due to social media. That was on the back of the stalker, Samuel Walker, the snitch. I was ragged into custody because I was harassing him, so they said. I got arrested for a set of sacrates. That was me doing the gardening of my baby mother's nana's house. I was doing the gardening. I went to Manchester to see someone. I've had them in my pocket. I'm arrested for the set of sacrates. I'm kept on bail for two years. Then two years on bail, the first year of that, the police bailed me to the Grisdale estate. Knowing quite well that the shooting had happened a few months before, they left me on that estate and I had to sign on three times a week and I had a curfew. So consistent paranoia kicked in. I was in a place of danger and I couldn't remove myself oh, from there. Shit off. I had rats trying to breach me on my license as well. Law. Right through all that, I have not returned to crime. I've encouraged others to leave them circles of crime. I've been screaming since 2016, choose a life, not a knife, Calnath UK. There's reasons why I do this. The message originated through me being on stringent license conditions, locked in a house in St. Helens with no money, no electricity, and probation trying the hardest to breach me. I was about to kill myself with a knife. Something popped up on my phone, an hashtag, choose a life, not a knife. It stopped me there and then. The knife got put down. Since then, I've carried it. It's gone from self-harm to knife crime. It's gone from knife crime to drug dealing and a whole umbrella of other things. And when all you've heard out of my mouth for the past five years is choose a life, not a knife. That's why I deliver this message the way I do. I haven't earned no money on the back of it. I haven't become a millionaire on the social platforms I've had. I've been targeted left, right and centre by the, great, the same group of criminals in the city of Liverpool that tried to shoot me dead in 2004 and continue to harass me right now. In 2004, 2002, that war, I was 24 years old. I was 23 years old. Within the city of Liverpool, you had a serious organised crime group headed by William Moore and John Moore. These were 44-year-old men, millionaires, that have been distributing narcotics for a long, long time since I was a child. They tried to bully me, they tried to tell us what to do, and we switched on them and fought them. We took them to the cleaners and they didn't like it. The result was they tried to get me shot dead. They never succeeded. 
they ended up getting themselves lifed off doing 30 years recommendations. They now spin a narrative that I'm a snitch and I'm this and I'm that because they're in jail. Let's not forget why they're in jail and let's not forget why I was placed in jail by myself. All my co-accused got not guilties on my trial. I was the only individual convicted. There was no snitching on our trial other than Anthony Christian and Tony Christian. William Moore got 30 years because they shot dead an 18-year-old child in the streets of Liverpool. It was a brutal murder and they deserved to get the 30 recommendations they got. It's powerful. It's deep. It's my story. It's where I've come from. It's, it's made me the person who I am today. The traumatic, the traumatic lifestyle I've had from sexual abuse from my old father and a policeman at the age of 13, 14 and 15. Right up to attempts on my life. Right up to getting involved into the murder of David Regan, who eventually it came out was an innocent participant in anything. I don't care or give it about anything that the criminal fraternity say about me. I'm not on that page with them. I'm on a page of redemption. I've been on the path of redemption for the past five years and everyone has tried to knock me off it. The only people I've had support are the virtual people. The people that I thought were here to help me that have led into me life as absolutely, and that's why I'm very isolated, and that's why I like being isolated. I like being a lone wolf for them reasons. I don't trust many people. The people I do embrace, so it's hard to trust people now. But I'm here. I'm still breathing. I'm strong as ever. I turned to cannabis to deal with the trauma and the events of the last five years. I started abusing cannabis. That cannabis caused serious psychological harm to my mental capacity. I've now stopped smoking cannabis. And since I've stopped smoking that cannabis, then traumatic incidents are coming back thick and fast. I'm not sleeping. I weren't eating. But now, everything's falling into place for me. I had an experience six months ago, and it was real. People think I'm mad when I speak about that experience. I will not go into it any further. That experience took everything off my shoulders. Give me a friend's, a fresh set of energy. I'm now on a different level of consciousness. And you only get to that level of consciousness when you've been to the depths of depression I've been in. When you've been in them dark holes and you can't find the light. I am now the light. And I've been here trying to encourage the youth of all names, of all races and of all colours to turn your back on that life of crime because it does nothing but leaves you in a mess in your later years. Don't. Get caught up in the materialism fate that everyone else is caught up in. Re-identify with yourself. Focus on who you are. It doesn't matter what your brother was like. It doesn't matter what your dad was like. You are completely different. You haven't got to take the path they've taken. You haven't got to go into prison. You haven't got to commit violent crime. You haven't got to do all that poison comes and bites you on the arse later on in life. There's repercussions to everything you do. Every action, every word. Everything you put out there is going to come back to you in time. I suggest you start refocusing on yourself. Understanding what the word life means. It can mean a couple of things in our communities. Life imprisonment or a good life. That's all it means. Choose a life, not a knife, Cal Nath UK. It's powerful. It's here to stay. It doesn't matter if I'm shot dead tomorrow for what I preach. It doesn't matter how they kill me. And it doesn't matter what happens to me. I've left a legacy. And it's a righteous legacy. 
and people will carry the flame for me once I'm dead. I know I'm penetrating them groups of youth. I know I'm making them have another look. I know it is working and it's helping others to change their ways and assess their lives. Choose a life, not a knife is genuine. It's not sought out in a back room with council officials and policemen. I hate police, but appreciate they've got a job to do. The police hate me and they don't appreciate the job I'm doing. I don't give two f if we haven't got council officials back on this message. I don't give two f if the police are not back on this message. What I do know now is that the young parents, the young dads, the nanas within our city, within our community, are now understanding what I've been preaching for the last five years because most of the things I've been speaking about are now becoming true. They're becoming evident. You are getting young girls stabbed to death in the city of Liverpool. You are getting young men shot dead and people not willing to bring the people and the individuals responsible to justice. You are getting young kids ganging up on fathers and dads of families of children. This is what's happening within our community. And this is what I've been screaming about since my release from custody. I'm going to continue to speak about this stuff. I'm going to continue to raise awareness and try and protect the children and protect the future. If we do not protect the children from any house or any background, the future is looking. Use parents, use brothers who's been through, have been through, or similar, or just a little bit of it. You need to start understanding that them children on your streets who are not being fed, them children whose mums have got addictions and whose dads are incarcerated, for they're the future. Because they're being neglected from the family home doesn't mean everyone's got to neglect them. There's broken homes up and down the country. There's children entering the prison system in the thousands. The government don't get the biz The prison system is now a business. It's owned by corporations. The customers for them businesses are us, my kind, people like me from the streets, born and bred on the streets, not being fed properly, not being raised properly, having got parents that are focused on them, the people that have got parents who are focused on addictions. If you can't appreciate where I come from, if you can't appreciate what I've been through and where I am right now, you're not seeing sense. You're not understanding the situation and you don't know what's going on upon your streets and the dangers and the environment that your children are living in. The danger and the obstacles that all the youth are experiencing right now, right around the country, is huge. It's not just your drug dealing scumbags that are trying to groom them and harass them and make them commit crime. You've got paedophiles crawling in walls that are there to harm your children. I can go on all night. I can preach these words of wisdom all night. They need to be acknowledged by the people that matter. And that's use. I can continue to scream at the top of my lungs. I can lose sleep. I can be skint and poor because I can't get employment. I'm, in, I'm unemployable because of what I speak. People won't come round me because they're scared of the organised crime groups that are attacking me. Because I'm, expected, I'm exposing their point ways on a regular basis. I don't give to Amir for the right reason. I've been given this message to deliver this message. I'm delivering this message the best I can. I'm convinced I'm being watched from the skies. I'm convinced I'm being guided on this path of righteousness and redemption. That's why nothing and no one will stop me doing what I'm doing. The only, peer, the only individual that can stop me doing what I'm doing is the man in the skies. And I'm his soldier. I'm not a drug dealer's soldier. I'm not a policeman's soldier. I'm his in the skies soldier. 
and I'm one of a kind. I've got the voice to scream out and I'm doing it. I'm going to stop it there because I'm getting too passionate and I don't want news people start thinking he's getting angry or he's ranting. This isn't ranting. This is speaking the truth about a message that is very powerful and has got the ability to penetrate the minds of the youth and adults to make you think about what the going on on your streets to our children, to our future. All you dirty, dying drug dealers who know the damage you're doing, who know the destructive environments you're placing the children in. He's lining up on a wall and you need whipping, decapitating and blinding. Karma will catch up to all of you in one way or another. Trust me. I've been there. I participated in dealing drugs. That's when I was blind. I've woke the cup and I encourage all you to wake the cup. Paired with the fake lips. It's all, it's all materialism, fakeness. You need to re-identify with yourself before it's too late. Because karma doesn't just affect you. It can affect everyone around you. Your siblings, your children and your family. Peace out. L5 shout. I'm speaking truths. I'm speaking facts. Got no re reason. I'm not stuck up my own ass. I'm not bigging myself up. And the whole objective here is to protect the youth. It's there in the background. Read it yourself. I've been carrying that message on these shoulders by myself for over five years. And it's been very, very, very heavy for me. Heavy. Lonely. It is what it is. I'm here to be alone because this message is heavy and it needs to be delivered. The people that come on board with this message, karma will treat you right. The energy you put into this message, that energy will come back to you. If you share this message to anyone, especially the youth, it will make them think. It will make them try and understand the path they're on. The majority of the kids, whether it's Manchester, Glasgow, Ireland, Liverpool, Salford, it does not matter. You need to get off the page of killing each other. You need to get off the page of this group mentality. You're killing our own individuals. You're killing our own race. You're killing our own people that have never been looked after by the government. We've always been left at the bottom of the pile. We've always been left to fend for ourselves. That's why the majority of us turn to drug dealing, fast cash, to get our family out of it. We, have, we all get caught up in that narrative. I'm selling drugs so my family can live a better life. You need to start thinking about the family down the road whose mother you've given addiction to and whose family has fallen to pieces. The ones where the kids are running around in the street, got all to wear and got all to eat. That's what you're creating. You're not looking after your family. You're damaging hundreds more. Peace out. L5 shout. Kalnak UK. Darren G from the streets of Liverpool. Embrace the message. Share, like and subscribe. Scouse, sit off, you.